So the urgent issue of the day is how does a person who is triggered to eat at off hours when they don't want to eat, now keep that in mind, the person is triggered when they have set up rules against doing it. In other words, when I stage the play to my willpower, I am going to stop eating at 7 o'clock tonight and that's it. That's how, we, that's how we operate. Well, what I'm doing is I'm pushing a pendulum. And the more willpower I use, the further to one side I push the pendulum. So I come in with a lot of vervent, uh, you know, just bigger. I'm just coming in prepared, I'm ready, I've set up the whole day for it. So what I'm doing is, since I'm constantly focused on one side of that equation, I am adding and adding and adding and adding and adding tension. I'm pushing it all the way up, that pendulum. So what happens is the force of that pendulum, it wants to come back. That's how reality works. And that pendulum, that counter force that was created through all of our preparedness, all of our thought taking that we did, it was all just uh, adding fear upon fear. So that preparedness was like stacking thoughts on top of each other in reality. That was fear and judgment. So we added fear and judgment, fear and judgment, fear and judgment. Every thought we took, oh, was this meal right? Is this going to be the one that's going to like make sure I don't, you know, binge tonight? Ah, well, I got enough macros in. Yeah, I, I did all my protein measures. I did my carbohydrate fast, so I'm good. I've got everything met. I don't need anything else. I can just tell myself, that's it. We're done. Boom. Game over. Well, unfortunately, that didn't work in application. It worked in theory, but in application it was an utter failure. So what happens is as soon as the mind starts to slow down and it starts to drift into the lower levels, it starts to diminish the conscious will in other words, what happens is the willpower goes to sleep at night. This is what night eating syndrome is, is that we've set up this counter force all day long, just like any eating disorder. But yet the willpower goes to sleep. So it starts to go down, 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 down. And as it does, that counter force starts to come through, and it comes through that reptilian brain, and that reptilian brain says, listen, you have been threatening me all day long with a starvation conflict. You have been threatening me that there's going to be a famine. So I'm going to start speaking to you, and I'm going to start telling you to store you want to create a famine, I'm going to store, 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 store. I want some fat. I want some peanut butter. Give me some sugar. Give me some sugar so I can store it. I need some insulin to store it. See, that reptilian brain has been on survival mode because imagine this. Imagine that you got a bill in the mail from the IRS. And the IRS sends you a bill saying you owe $1,200 today. Pay up now or else. Well, there's a threat, right? So you're going to be on edge. You're going to be in survival for your finances. Well, maybe $1,200 does not do anything for you. Maybe it's got to be they want $150,000 or more right now. I don't care what it is. It's a threat. But let's just say this. A few days later, they sent you another one. And a few days later, they send you another one. Well, what's happening is that all of your resources are going to come to the surface eventually from that reptilian brain. 
it's going to start sending to you signals to take action. It's going to cause you to not sleep at night, perhaps, because it's saying, look, solution has to be found or we'll die. See, what it sees is it sees death. It's, it's afraid. So you can see the analogy of how you'd act if every time you saw a letter from the IRS came in the mail and started to come every three days, how it would trip you up. And you can see yourself in that picture. But what you don't see is yourself in the picture when you're doing the eating and you're setting up the stage hours before. So what you're doing hours before is you are focusing your thought on the problem. You take a meal and you say, this is going to help solve the problem. Well, what that is, is that's the bill showing up in the mail and you opening the envelope. There's trauma number one. Now, trauma number one puts the reptilian brain in shock. But then what happens is you start setting up the next meal or the next macronutrient count or making sure you took all the right vitamins. Uh, in other words, you're setting up, every time you take an action and a thought based on that, you set up another bill in the mail. So pretty soon you're bombarded with a stack of bills in the mail, and it's starting to look serious now. Like, this, is the, this, is, this has got to happen now. Now, you see, all of that is that counter force. And that's why bill collectors do that, is they do it to get you to take action. They know if they can create enough pain on one side, you know, or enough fear <clears throat> that you'll move away from it. Because they know that humans move away from pain and towards pleasure and away from fear towards peace. So they want to tip the scales and make it extremely one-sided. If I don't take action now, it's going to cause me way more pain than if I take action. You see, before that, you had considered not paying and you thought that because the idea of having some of your resources around and not paying them was a little more pleasurable, they're going to tip the scales to make it like, oh, I'm going to give them these resources so they'll go away. See, they're tipping the scales with the pain and pleasure. Now, this is important because this is how it ties in. So what's happening is you're setting up all of this counter culture to peace and harmony by putting into motion action based on the fear of the problem. So the equation is simple. We have, an act, we have action plus the fear plus the thought of the problem. This is the triad, if you will, that holds it all together. These are the components. There's an action, there's a fear, and there's a thought of a problem. And every time we put those three together, we create that pendulum force pushing it in one direction. So hours later, what happens is let's say we come to our arrangement. Hey, you know, at 7 o'clock I said I'm not going to eat anymore. That's my thing. Okay, now what's what we don't understand is the pendulum has already been cocked and loaded. We've already pushed that thing up. So our willpower is still intact. We're fine. As long as we have our willpower intact, we're, we're good. You know, listen, I've been good all day. Shoot, this is nothing. I'm still wide awake, feeling great. 7 o'clock, boom, cutoff time, baby. Willpower is up. Now, unfortunately, what's going to happen is because we've stacked up all of these action plus fear plus thought of a problem, what that does is that equals the pain signaling. That equals pain signaling because here's why. Action creates cellular memory, which creates reaction. That's karma. We take an action, then comes a cellular memory, and then a reaction. 
So that's guaranteed. We've already set something into motion. Now when we add fear, what we're doing is we're adding a strong emotion, which is very creative. It's a creative force. If you fear something, it comes upon you, said Paul in the Bible. It comes upon you. And that thought is what comes upon you. That thought, that sneaking thought that is the sponsoring thought, if you will. I know you're probably saying to yourself, well, no, the thought was of me fasting through the night. That's what we are doing here. We're setting it up so I can fast through the night. In fact, I visualized it. I saw it happen. I prepared for it. You know, I saw myself get up in the morning happy, etc. Okay, I get that. But in a world of duality, there's always another side to the story, and that's called sponsoring thought. See, we're trying to change reality with that thought we just envisioned ourselves doing. We're trying to change something. Now, what we're saying is, at the current moment, there's more pain to the thought of me waking up in the morning, feeling hungover and drunk from all this food I ate. I don't want to do this anymore. Look at how bad I hate myself now, and the whole cascade of negativity that sets up. Well, <laughs> that is a painful thought right now. Right now, there's more pain to that thought. So we create a sense of pleasure and we move away. We say, ah, yes, look at, imagine that waking up in the morning. I feel incredible. You know what? I did it. I set my rules. I met my macros. I ate perfect. Good luck with that. Because what happens is as soon as that willpower goes down to sleep, what you have is you have the hunger pain, the hunger pain and the thought, okay? So what you have is you have a karmic episode coming up. See, most often at one time, we experience, let's say, if you will, improper weaning or a starvation conflict or some sort of nourishment conflict that sets up, remember, it's the action plus the fear plus the thought. So at some point in our life, we took an action and there was fear there because of a thought. For example, when I had eating disorders, I started to starve myself before I realized I had an eating disorder. And I would be hungry and ravenous through the night. And what I did is I created uh, a state of depletion inside where I kept exerting more and more and more, okay? And that triggered the reptilian brain to fear because I was depleting all of my resources, all of my energy, all of my nutrients were being withheld, and I was driving myself okay, to a state of overwork, over-exhaustion, over-training, if you will. So I have two things I'm doing. I'm setting up an impossible scenario where I could push, 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 and at the same time withhold, 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 withhold. But what is this? This is a thought. Somebody gave me that thought, that opinion, that that's how it was done. Somebody gave me the thought that that's how it was done. So the thought that they gave me was that you have to consume less calories than you burn every day and meet all of your macros, etc., and try to do this impossible scenario. I mean, imagine if you had a bank account and I told you that you have to spend more in your bank account than you put in every day. You're bankrupt. You're out of business. According to the world's knowledge, you're dead because finances equal your social proof in life. So if you're dead according to the world, if you did that, well, when you're living in the flesh and you're, somebody comes along and gives you this adaptation or this abhorration of harmony and says, listen, 
here's what you're going to do because you're fat. You know, look at you, the pain of being fat. You don't want this. You want to move away from it, right? So here's an idea. Here's a world idea. The world comes and gives you a world idea. You know, remember the, the opinions of man are the destruction of the entire planet. So this opinion of man comes along and says, well, here, this is common knowledge. You're going to have to believe there is such a thing as calories. Okay, because if I can't get you to believe in calories, I can't get you to believe in all the other lies that are going to come hereafter. Now, you believe with me, right, that if you take in more calories than you put out in expenditure, you're going to accumulate fat. Okay, now, this is another thing here. What is fat? They call it this thing fat. Well, we eat fat in our foods, peanut butter, we eat, uh, you know, fish oils, we eat things that are fat in our foods. Okay, apparently that's what they called it. So, are you telling me that the fat in my food is the same thing as the fat in my body? Because the fat in my body, when I look in the mirror, triggers something according to what I've seen in, in my culture that I'm not the size of the person on the magazine. I'm unwanted, I'm unloved, I'm rejected, I'm not good enough, I am not enough. Look at me, I'm not enough. Okay? So we create a pain, all right, another pain. I'm not enough. And so we're cornered by that pain that says we need, we need to find a way out. There's got to be a way out of not being enough, all right? So what we do is then we run into the world's knowledge. And the world's knowledge is like a drug dealer on the corner. And it says, hey, you just went through a hard time in life? Listen, I got a little something for you. You just snort a little bit of this stuff and shoot this into your arm? You're going to feel good real quick. You're going to feel good. We got the answer. Yeah, this is the answer. So then like a drug addict, your five senses attached to the world's knowledge. And to set up the impossible. In other words, to go out with a bank account and to put in five bucks every day and to spend seven. It just doesn't work in a perfectly mathematical universe. You see, I can break the whole calorie theory model by understanding simple mathematics. If I am exerting more than I take in, then how sustainable is that when the reptilian brain is going to look at that and it's going to come to an agreement that you are trying to kill yourself? You are trying to not exist. I mean, isn't that what losing weight is? I want to exist, exist less so I can be less present, I can be less visible to everyone? <laughs> Enough about that. Now listen, since you're trying to set up an impossible scenario, it's absolutely impossible. It's ludicrous, in fact. For a short period of time, willpower is on your side because you don't have any pushback for a while. You don't have any pushback for a while because the reptilian brain is incredibly, like, not logical. So it doesn't really see what you're doing yet. But what happens is you've drunk of the world's poison. So you go out and you start burning, 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 and you start getting less and less and less and less and less. And then the reptilian brain starts to realize Huh. you know, I'm looking at the bank sheet here, and um, we're taking in 2,000 calories a day. We need about, you know, 1,800 of these so-called calories, these nutrients, like levels, etc. We need these things to live. We're starting to wither away to nothing. I'm going to start sending some hunger pains. So it starts sending some hunger pains. Okay. Now, where did it get this information from? Where did it get this information from? You see, it got the information from the world's knowledge. It didn't have the information that calories were real. It didn't have any information. It didn't have any of this knowledge. This is world knowledge. You're a spiritual being. 
You exist in the spirit. The fallen state of man is the carnal, the flesh. And everything about the carnal is enmity against God. So what we have to understand is that this world knowledge is how your brains, your three brains, your conscious mind takes in, you know, this world knowledge. It puts together all of these facts, so-called facts. And then it delivers it over through the repetition of it, you know, repetitioning it over and over and over. That's called programming. So then it starts to program, you know, what they call the unconscious mind. The emotional brain gets involved. And then the reptilian brain is wired. The reptilian brain wants to eat, it wants to mate, and it wants to kill. And what it wants to do is keep you alive at all costs. So you go out and you start losing some weight, and you're getting thinner, and you're burning more and more calories, and then, you know, you push it even further. <clears> hey, <throat> maybe we can hold back just a little bit more. And the brain starts to see that you're insane, that your conscious mind has gone off, it's gone rogue, it's not, uh, it's not willing to play ball, it's diseased. Your conscious mind is diseased because it was infected from, from a virus from the beginning. Okay, the whole concept of calories and macros and this and this, you know, it says in the Bible, you're not defiled by what goes in your mouth, you're defiled by what comes out of your mouth. So somebody defiled you from what came out of their mouth, which was the world's knowledge. Food is neutral. It has no value whatsoever. It has no value whatsoever, period. That is the truth of truths, and it will be virtually impossible to understand it until you start to prove some of it here. So what's happening here? is you've gone off the ledge. You know, you got one foot off the ledge. That's how your reptilian brain sees what's happening here. So it starts to send you some signals, some big signals. You know, like, hey, we're so hungry. We need to store, we need to store, we need to store, we need to store. And it controls the flesh. The reptilian brain controls the flesh. That's the lizard brain. That's the flesh brain. That's the carnal mind. So it's going to go into overdrive itself and tell you that you need more, 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 more. And what happens is you binge and then you know, a state of euphoria comes over you because you've just satisfied a very, very powerful urge and you've got all of the chemical release from all of the drugs and the food, you know, all of the excitotoxins, uh, all of the chemical additives. It's all fake. It's all fake food. It's all designed to make you addicted to it. So, like I said, you've gone to the drug dealer and the drug dealer knows that if you snort and you, his powder and you stick that in your arm, you start to believe in that whole system, that you're going to run into the other side and you're going to get extorted by the other drug dealer that's going to deliver you the fix for the shock you just put yourself in. So you go to one drug dealer, one liar, one opinion of man, and it tells you, this is how the world works, this is how your body gets fat or thin, etc., do this, do that. And that's why it's always changing. One day carbs are good, the next day they're evil. One day, you know, uh, one thing is good, the next day it's bad because they're all lies. The drug dealer will constantly change over time, but it'll all be the same game. So I go to the world's knowledge and it's full of you know what, and it sends me on this track, and all of a sudden, you know, it trips up against my survival instincts. My reptilian brain is really getting offended by this uh, because it sees what's up. It, you know, it sees what's up that this mind has gone insane with this virus it picked up from the drug dealer. And so then we go to the other drug dealer, and the other drug dealer says, listen, I know why you're in pain. I got something to solve that pain here. Just try a bite of it. And that's full of all kind of chemical additives laced with this and that. And then what happens is now 
you've set up a loop where your reptilian brain understands how to get you to comply. And so the problem is, is the next day after you do it, you have guilt and shame, and you start to beat yourself up for it and call yourself names and look in the mirror and you feel that disgust conflict all over again that you started with. You're right back where you started. You're right back where you started. Remember, you first looked in the mirror, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not enough. And then you do it again because now you've gone through this whole destructive cycle, created a problem where it didn't exist, and now you're living inside of this disorder. And you're looking in the mirror and you're like, well, look, now look at me, I'm disgusted. So what do you do? You go back and you reactivate the same program again. The same program that puts you in this mess, now you reactivate it, but now you push harder. Now you're pushing the pendulum harder because willpower must be the answer. It must be the answer because that's how I got this thing started the first time. But see, the problem is, is willpower fades. And as soon as a, will, a person's willpower runs out, then the person is completely controlled by the reptilian brain. It's completely controlled. It's primitive. It's primal at that point. So we have to look at why is the reptilian brain wanting to do this to you? It's because you went off and you took the first drug dealer's poison. You started to believe that that drink had 140 calories and 24 grams of sugar in it. You started to believe that that peanut butter is 180 calories per tablespoon and it's got uh, 16 grams of fat, 4 carbs, uh, 6 grams of protein. And you started to believe that that slice of lean beef is 40 grams of protein as long as it fits the size of my palm. And you started to believe that that treadmill that I just walked on, I just did an hour, I burned 450 calories. And you started to believe that if I get up in the morning in a fasted state and I drink my coffee and I work out high intensity for 15 minutes, it'll burn more calories residually. And you started to believe that if I eat that piece of cake, oh my goodness, it's going to store because I didn't uh, burn that many calories today. And you bought the whole thing. You bought the whole thing, hook, line, and sinker. The whole matrix of food deception you became adulterated, just like the food you're eating. So the secret is we go back to being childlike innocent. So a child is ignorant to the most part of the world's knowledge when it comes into the world. Now, being ignorant, it is soon surrounded by adulterated people. They call them adults for a reason. Think about it. Right in plain sight where you'll never see it. So you're surrounded by all of these adulterated individuals that have all of these opinions to share with you and rules and regulations and laws and they start to put all of this on you and confine you into the prison that they're in. Whatever prison that their mind is in is certainly what is imposed upon you. Over time it gets worse and worse. So if you picked it up as a young child well, then it came from your obvious environment that you were in. The rules and regulations that were hoisted upon you about this food being good, that food being bad, this one's okay, that one's not okay. Be careful not to eat that one. That'll make you fat. Be careful of that one because that one is only for adults. You see, they started to give you all of the world's wisdom. And if you happen to slip by till you were older and you started to develop it, well, just look back to when you started to buy in to the first lie that led to the whole thing. So the first lie that I bought into was that, ah, look at me. I am fat, and I thought, well, how do I get skinny? And I thought, ah, here's a program if I eat six times a day, and I have three meal replacement powders. It's a great marketing strategy, by the way. And then I have three small meals. As long as I keep my calories low, wow, I didn't even know of that. So, wow, somebody just told me about that. Wow, calories, okay. So how many is that? Oh, oh, they say it's 10 per 
Uh, pound the body weight if I'm trying to gain is 8 per body weight if I'm trying to lose. So I should take in 1,600 calories a day if I'm cutting and then cycle it with 18 and some days on a big, big day I can have 22, etc. So I start to do this, you know, and I'm on this track and it's going great because I'm seeing results and it's all working. And, um, you know, that uh, willpower is happening. But then, you know, um, I start to realize that a little ain't enough for me. Yeah, I want more. So I start to amp it up, you know. Hey, look, this is working. Let's do more. Let's do more. Yeah. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do 1,200 calories a day, and I'm going to work out three times. Not just one, three times. I'm going to get more. Then I'm going to do more and more and more and more and more and more because it always wants more. The ego always wants more. And see, that's the nature of how this drug works. You see, they give you a hit of the drug. Oh, look at it. It worked. You're off to a good start. It's starting to happen. Your body's getting thinner. Everything's working just like they told you to. The drug, the lie, the lie is producing. But see, then what happens is we want more. We want more and more. We become uh, drunk, if you will, intoxicated. See, the, the good word is intoxicated. We become intoxicated by the lie. And so much so that the lie now runs every decision that we make. In other words, every action that we take is held in place by the lie itself, where the lie becomes the Lord of our life. See, the lie becomes the Lord of our life. It says what action we can and can't take. It creates the very fear that it produced in the first place. And it also determines every thought that flashes across the screen of our mind from all of the impressions it's picked up. It has its own field. It's a morphogenic field. It's a body of collective conscious decisions that were made by opinions that made a body of knowledge. And that body of knowledge is a kingdom. That is a kingdom. Now that kingdom is the kingdom of darkness. It's the world's knowledge. It's carnal mindedness. That's enmity against God. And so whenever we have a kingdom that sets itself up in rebellion to God, it comes crashing down. It gets destroyed. And that's how God operates. So God is going to destroy this kingdom for the good because God is good. God is going to express itself. And anything that is a shadow that comes in the way of that, which is the ignorance of this world, the shadow truth, see, the shadow, everything that's real casts a shadow, but the shadow is not the full picture. The shadow is incomplete. And so the world is the world of incompleteness. It's the shadow cast from the truth. So we have to know the truth and the shadow if we want wisdom. Now, the shadow is what we're living in when we're living under the spell of this entire body model. This is where it all begins. It all begins with identifying with a mortal flesh, skin, bone, blood identity. When we identify in flesh, as flesh, as a mortal, then we are subject under the law, and the law is of sin and death. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing the law operate, the law of sin and death, through your members, as in your five senses. 
So you've got this problem. Well, this problem is the law of sin and death operating through your members. It's a giant conundrum because it's not going to be solved by a human mind because the, the human mind is what created the problem where it didn't exist. You see, everything that is real is infinite, omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. Omnipresent means it's always here at all time and space regardless. Your breath is omnipresent and awareness is omnipresent. You're always experiencing breath with life. And you're always experiencing awareness with life. But you're not always experiencing night eating syndrome at every time of existence that you have recorded in your memory bank. It's not there every time, which means it's not omnipresent. And by its very nature, if it's not omnipresent, God didn't create it. And if God didn't create it, then it doesn't have any power other than ignorance to sustain itself. And so the only suffering in the world is ignorance of the Father. But when one comes to know the Father, ignorance gets cast out like a light coming on. And when the light comes on, the darkness disappears. So the truth that brings lightness to the whole idea of night-eating syndrome is we look to where it all began when we divided ourselves. Now the five steps to sin consciousness, first thing is there's a fear, and then comes confusion, then comes lack of trust, then double-mindedness and division. That's how sin consciousness comes about. That's how one becomes carnally minded. And you can run it backwards and see how, you know, looking at it from God's perspective, looking down, if you will, from above, you can say division is the first thing, as in this person forgot that their life is in me, eternal, in spirit. This person is double-minded. This person's identifying as flesh, bones, blood, mortal, but I am none of these things. And if I am omnipresent, then I am the life of everything that I've created. So what is this superstition that calls itself life, but yet it has no life? It's a counterfeit shadow. So the shadow is cast. Well, God's going to put the light where the shadow is. And so when the light comes, it is death and destruction to the shadow. Now, this person has lack of trust. Well, how could God not have trust within his own members? Again, it's a shadow. It's the serpent knowledge. So we take the serpent knowledge and we're identifying with a shadow. And so the light comes. Okay, so the person is confused because they aren't really sure what happened because they're trying to find a solution in the same place the problem's being created. And there isn't a solution there. And the person is obviously living in fear fearful for its own existence, but yet it has no existence, because God is the only existence. God is all in all. And that is the light that destroys this whole darkness, because God is, and outside of God, he is not. Very simple. So if God is, and God didn't create any of this, well then, it must be in the category of is not. But yet if it is not, and we're experiencing it, well where does it get its power from? 
It gets its power from ignorance itself. And what are we doing when we're ignorant? Well, the first thing is we allow a fear to come into our mind. Now that fear begins early in the day. I'm going to set up my whole day to prevent myself from binging again tonight. Now why would you even have a thought like that if you didn't have a fear in the first place? You would not have the thought like that because the fear is where the thought comes from. Now, who would you be being? Who would you be being if you did not have a fear? In other words, if you were being a person that takes no thought for what they eat, just simply nourishes themselves as they feel they truly need some nourishment. When you're truly hungry, when you're truly in communion with other people, in other words, they take no thought at all. I remember when I was a little kid, that's what I used to do. I used to go out and play, hang out with my friends, and then my grandparents would always say, listen, you know, it's dinner time. I was raised by my grandparents. They'd say, it's dinner time. You have to come in and eat. So I'd come in and I'd eat. Now, I didn't pay attention to calories or anything. I just ate till I was full and then I was done. I ate till I was full and then I was done. I never took a thought about when's my next meal going to come from and I hope it's going to be the right macros or it better not be too much or I'll be fat. I didn't have any of those thoughts. I was living in childlike innocence. I was being a person in trust with God. In other words, there was an absence of the fear. Now, what I'm telling you is that the whole thing rests upon a fear itself. And the fear is not what you think. Again, your thinking is what got you in this trouble. Your fear is this. Your fear is that if I don't fit into a certain model, that has been proven to be well received by the public at large. In other words, if, if I don't if I don't see myself as good enough because of some opinion that showed up in my life somewhere, maybe someone broke my heart because fear comes after the broken heart. So I know exactly at what point this came into your life. Because fear comes after the broken heart. So at some point someone broke my heart and I had an opinion about me and who I am in the world at the time that set forth a frequency to attract all of this into my life. I remember when it happened to me. I remember losing my first daughter because I had to give up full custody. And I was still in love with her mom. Yet I was not a good person to her. So she had you know, done the right thing by not dating. We were not good together, period. But I was definitely not somebody who was ready to be a parent at that time in my life. But regardless of the story, what the conflict or the brain picking up the pain was that I am all alone. I'm all alone. 
I'm not loved, I'm a bad person, see I was plagued with guilt and shame. See, the reality is I felt a loss of love. which led to a whole series of I am less than ideas. And once we start sinning in that direction, we are living from the pain. And living from that pain, we run into the drug dealer, number one, and he sets up the deal. And he says, listen, you got yourself in pain, I got you out. This is going to make you feel good. So what happens is, you know, we get a little bit better looking. And then they start to look at us different. You know, I started to get a little bit better looking, and she saw me one day, and she was, like, looking at my body like, oh, my goodness. Like, you know, and, and I started a bar a few weeks later, and we, we made out at a bar. You know, she had left me, moved on. She's getting married to somebody else, and they're going to raise my biological daughter. But yet, she's making out with me at a bar. So what I see is that, wow, having this, you know, ability to eat less and be thinner, I, I'm loved. <clears throat> I'm loved. But see, that's carnal. Again, that's carnal. That's still ignorance because that's not the love of the Father. That's the world's love. That's the world's love. And what happens is I'm going to need more and more of that drug because the effects are very temporary. Because the world's love is very, very fleeting. Because you'll be good one day, but the next day somebody else is better. And you're not going to be young forever, so every single day something's going to come against you that's going to remind you of how much time you've wasted, how less life you have, how someone else is better than you, and look what you haven't done, so you should be guilty, you should be ashamed, and you're going to be beat up by all of this stuff. And it's going to have you go looking for that drug dealer again because you found out one time or another you found out at one time that you could believe in this whole calorie theory and the whole cutting yourself, cutting back and doing this and that, and then you started to get a little bit of love and appreciation from your world because, wow, look at you dropped 10 pounds. I can see it in your chin. You look fantastic. Wow. Everybody started to give you an artificial replica of what you had been missing the whole time. See, fear came when you had the broken heart. But you never healed the broken heart. The broken heart can only be healed by restoring knowledge of the Father. And that knowledge comes through experience itself. It comes from the inside out. And so no matter how hard you try, you can't break this conundrum. Because you're looking out, outside for the solution. You're looking out there. It all comes from a broken heart. When fear came in and you bought the whole ignorance that it all has to do with the body and you set up a whole pendulum swing to keep recreating the scenario over and over and over again. And so when we recreate a scenario over and over and over again, it means we haven't got the lesson yet. We're in the movie Groundhog's Day. So if you want to understand what's happening to you, then you need to watch the movie Groundhog's Day. So in the movie, Bill Murray finds himself waking up, having the same day, literally in chronological time, etc. Every single day he wakes up, it's Groundhog's Day, every single day. And he's in the same place, the same bed. And so no matter what he does, he goes out, and he tries to do all of these things. He you know, tries to kill himself. He tries to do everything. And he keeps waking up in the same bed, the same morning, the same day. So essentially, he only has one day to live, and it's the same day every day. But what he puts into the day, 
he's trying to figure out. These are these variables. He's trying to solve the problem. He's stuck, like you're stuck in the Nightingale Syndrome. He can't solve the problem. He wants to move on with his life and get out of this, whatever this is. And what finally happens, is he begins to realize what love is. He begins to realize what love is. And he starts to demonstrate that love from within himself. And then he has a moment of that unity with God that you may or may not recognize in the movie, but there comes this moment when he is uni in unity with God. In other words, a complete state of rest, as in, you know, taking a break from the whole process of where he put the pendulum every single day, setting up his resistance for the day. See, going into the mind and trying to solve it with the thing that's causing the very problem itself is Groundhog's Day. And that's what everybody does until they finally get a revelation. And that revelation sets them free because it shines the light on the whole thing and it just goes away. It's like a dream. You're waking up from a bad dream. That's what it was like when he went free. It's like you wake up from a bad dream. This is all a dream. It's a dream state of consciousness and it's held together by a fear which is triggered by the initial onset of the broken heart. And that broken heart is when you fell from grace and you identified with your ego consciousness and you started to look to the world itself for your validation. And when you look to the world for your validation, you start to pick up the world's knowledge like drug dealers on the corner. And one leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And before you know it, you're caught in a maze, and it's the labyrinth of your mind. You're stuck. You're in a groundhog's day, and there's no way out. Because every day, you wake up in that same bed, and it's the same problem. And the faces might change, and they might look a little different, but you recognize it's the same problem. So that problem is, I still operate by looking outside of myself for validation through the world that crucified Jesus himself. The world crucified Jesus, who was pure love. The world killed and destroyed love itself. So what makes you think that you are going to get an ounce of love in that same world. You're not. So what happens is you're continuing to look to man's thoughts, man's consciousness, man's solution to a spiritual problem that involves who you're being. You're out of alignment with the will of God because you are out of trust. You are outside of the innocence that brings childlike faith because you're still living through the original traumatic experience of when that fear kicked in. Because that fear created unity with you. In other words, you became married. You're an adulterer. That's what it means to be an adulterer in the spiritual realm. See, what happens is, you know, you left your wife, which is your oneness with God, in trust, childlike innocence, knowing that God was always going to support everything for you, and that you had to take no thought for it, but to simply go and enjoy your life, and everything would be done on your behalf. Your steps would be led. 
God is beyond what that little doubting, erring mind of yours can even come close to comprehending. You left that like the prodigal son, and you went out into the world, and you became impoverished because you were the rich person in the world who was poor in spirit. And you realized that the world had nothing to offer. So you return to the Father, and that returning to the Father happens through the knowledge of the Father. And the only way to know the Father is to know what the Father said, because God is the Word. The Word of God is what God is thinking about you and thinking you into existence as being. The real you. And so what I need to see and to come into agreement with is what is God knowing to be true about all of this so-called night-eating syndrome and problem that I appear to be having? Well, the revelation comes when I realize that every compensatory action I'm taking. In other words, remember, it's action plus fear plus thought. So every action I'm taking that's coming from the fear itself means that I am in the kingdom of darkness or ignorance held captive like a prisoner. So what God is knowing is that Christ came to set the captives free, okay? And in Romans 8.10, the scripture says that if you are in the body, it is dead because of sin. Now, if you are in the body, that means you are identifying as this ego, flesh, bones, blood, separate from everyone. I have my own existence that is subject to the world's approval and opinions. Okay? It is dead because of sin. But if you are in spirit, it is life because of righteousness. So if you are in spirit, it is life because of righteousness. Well, righteousness is the power of God. You know, the right hand is the power of God. So if we look at righteousness, you know, that's the right way of being. So the power of God is in the spirit. And the power of God is the light that shines through the darkness. And so we need to get back into the power of God because it's going to take God's power to get us out of this groundhog day. We're going to need to come into an entirely different reality altogether. We're going to need to wake up from the dream. You're in a dream. So if spirit is what sets us free from the law of sin and death, because being in Christ is what sets us free, and Christ died on the cross to the flesh to show us that life was not in the flesh. He came to show humans through their five senses of where they had fallen, from grace. They were identified in the body, taking thought about the body, living through the drug-dealing world thought leaders that focus on all of this body consciousness stuff. You 
And he showed there was no life whatsoever inside that body because life eternal was when he was resurrected and there was no life left in that thing that he left behind. In fact, he showed the body was in the spirit. He lived in the body, the spirit body, the eternal self. That's the power of the resurrection. And so since he lives inside of you, in fact, it's you actually living inside of him, if you want to know the truth, you're an idea in the mind of God at the right hand with the Father as an equal to Jesus. So if you're an equal to Jesus, you're an heir, just like the prodigal son. This is the good news. Once you step into that identification of yourself, that's who I am. That is who I am. You're a child of a king, of the Most High, the highest ruler in existence, an equal to Jesus that had dominion over every demon, every sickness, every, every evil spirit. He bore all of it on the cross and took all of it and said, it is finished on the cross. So over 2,000 years ago, it was already finished. He took all of your sickness, including this dream of Nighting Syndrome, he took all of it on the cross, and he ended it. He finished it. He fulfilled the law. So you no longer live under the law the curse of sin. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. You no longer live under the spell of that groundhog's day because Jesus already captured it and finished it. The law has been fulfilled and you are now in Christ, an equal at the right hand of the Father. So get back to where you belong. And the broken heart is instantly healed because you will know from experience that you never had a life of your own. God is all in all. And you never had to take thought or worry about anything that you will eat or drink or the clothes that you wear. Because you know who you are in the Father. Now you have to knock and the door will be opened. Seek and you shall find. This is the truth. Not the counterfeit world knowledge. This is the truth that will set you free out of your captivity. But you must press into it. And as you press into it, it presses through and into you. As you move towards God, you become more like God. So if you want to have less of things that are unlike God, sin, sickness, disease, and death, then first recognize who you are, because if you are in Christ, those things were already taken and finished. They're done. They've been done for over 2,000 recorded human years. In other words, it is already settled. It's over. Next is as I press into the Father, I become more in the likeness of the Father. 
like the ray exalting the sunshine. The more I exalt and praise the Father, the more my likeness becomes of the Father. So the solution to ignorance is knowledge of the Father. This is all ignorance made manifest through fear. And perfect love is what casteth out fear. Perfect is the Father. The only thing perfect is the Father. So the Father's love is what casts this entire thing out. Not through your understanding. Not leaning on your understanding. But a complete reverence and trust that God is who he says he is. And your act of faith to believe that God is who he says he is in spite of what your five senses tell you, what your neighbor tells you. Every man is a liar, but God is the only true reality. So as I cast down all of these false suggestions from a kingdom of darkness, and I rest, resting is receiving, as I rest on the word of God as if it is the truth no matter what, I see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. No matter what my mind thinks that it's picked up from someone else as an opinion, like a, a sneeze going around the room or a yawn for that fact, just because my mind has a suggestion doesn't mean I believe it. I cast it down if it's not in alignment with what God is. So the answer is quite simple. The more I become like my father, not my earthly father, because I am not a carnal mortal, the body is dead because of sin. Jesus already finished it. Jesus already took all of the sickness and ended it. It was settled over 2,000 years ago. Now I am in equal heirship with Christ because Christ lives in me. So I can command every evil spirit, every demon, every sickness to flee. So where does it begin? It all begins in the realm of fear, doubt, and then comes disease. So I say, in the name of Jesus, I command you, spirit of fear, to get out and never return. Get out. Jesus had the authority <clears throat> over all spirits, all devils, all disease. And he spoke to it all like a person. He didn't ask the Father to do it. He had the authority of the Father to do it. And so do you, because you are an equal in Christ. You now have the command yourself to use this authority. So I cast the spirit of fear out. Now I speak to you, you body of knowledge called night eating syndrome. I look to you as like you are a person, you are a devil. I command you in the name of Jesus, get out. Never show your face again. Get out. You are not welcome here from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. 
come in alignment with the Word of God now. Perfect love, fill me now. Perfect love, fill me now. I am perfect love now. It is done. Now we slay this dragon and we cast this demon back to the pit of hell or ignorance. Now we must walk in truth. We must walk in truth. That is where the faith brings the miracle. We've cast out the lie. Now we must walk in truth as if what God says to be true is the truth. God said to take no thought for our life what we shall eat or what we shall drink. And that perfect love casteth out fear. So if I am made perfect in the image and likeness of God as an heir to the throne, one with Christ at the right hand of the Father in spirit, eternal, resurrected out of the law of sin and death, then I am not subject to any of these opinions. I am already perfect in the Father image likeness of my Creator. Now I act like it. And to act like it means that I no longer give my power away to any of these ideas that there is any such thing as life, intelligence, substance inside of a condition called matter. And that condition called matter includes the idea of the calorie itself. The calorie doesn't govern my actions. With infinite intelligence as my true identity, I know exactly what to eat, when to eat it, and how much to eat without taking any secondary thought because without the fear, I am back in childlike innocence once again. And this is when the revelation hits you. That the righteous, their steps are laid out before them. Which means I can live in the present with God, enjoying all of his creation that he declared was good including if I sit down and I enjoy a meal, a meal, I can enjoy every moment of that knowing that I inherently have all of the wisdom within me to decide in that moment, in that moment, in that moment, what I will eat, how much I will eat, without taking any thought about any other moment, wondering when I'll eat again, or wondering if what I ate previously was too much. See, this is the sickness. I can live fully in the moment of my life experience in every moment of my life experience, recognizing that I am with the Father, one with the Holy Ghost, at the right hand with Jesus. So everything that comes into this moment 
already inherently I have all of the wisdom and intelligence to know exactly what to do as the moment appears to change. And it requires no thought about what will happen in the next moment or tomorrow's moment because those are abstract realities and fiction. In time, they don't exist. God is not in time. God is omnipresent. So I'm one with the Father in the present. Always in the present. And I know exactly what to do in every moment without taking any fear-based thought about what might come or what might happen. So I'm not putting any pendulum swing. I am not putting any pendulum swing into effect and setting up a counter force. Because I am very indifferent about what any moment is going to bring because I'm already in the love of the Father, made perfect in his wholeness as a spiritual reality. I am not in the body dead to sin. I've already claimed my healing because Jesus did it 2,000 years ago. And Jesus is my healing because he resurrected and gave me eternal life with him in the Father. So I can be here now, present, in this moment, setting forth no resistance by saying yes to what is completely and fully in every moment. Yes to what is completely and fully in every moment. Yes to what is completely and fully in every moment. And this surrendered state of being is a complete trust in God and what this brings is completeness into the realm of incompleteness or darkness and it casts out anything that is unlike itself and so all of the thought taking about food is unlike itself and it gets cast out. All of the ideas of calories, meals, food restrictions, weight, is unlike itself, and it gets cast out. Because by not pushing the pendulum all the way up, by pushing against what I don't want, because of fear, I can be made perfect and whole in the Father now, in this moment, and that perfect love will cast out all fear because the intelligence of this moment is God's wisdom. And as God's man, God's manifest, my purpose is to recognize God's wisdom as being complete. That recognition of completeness leaves nothing outside. And remember, if God is, then anything that is not is the outside. And the outside exists always in a fiction called past or future. And so anytime I move into past or future, I know that I'm in worry or doubt. I'm taking thought for my life. And if it has to do with food, then it is setting up the pendulum swing to keep the problem exactly where it is, outside of the present, because that's where I have been living in order to live in Groundhog's Day and sustain this dream. 
but I am now present to the present, and my lamp is burning bright. And now you are atoned.